All right. Um, thanks everyone for uh, taking the time and uh, attend uh, uh, Yiming's PhD defense. Um, so Yiming has been um, a PhD student in our group uh, over the past four years. Uh, I first became to know him about five years ago. Um, and then he joined us during pandemic, uh, <laughs> which uh, in which I'm sure he can share a lot of very interesting stories um, of the pandemic and everything uh, over the past four years at the end of his talk. Um, but uh, Yiming has been uh, quite productive and received um, some prestigious uh, fellowship awards. Um, and uh, without further ado, I think uh, we should have him today as his big day. So um, yeah, Yiming, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for coming here. I'm very happy and excited to present my dissertation. And the title is Collaborative and Retrospective Perception for Autonomous Vehicles. Let me firstly uh, briefly introduce myself. I have been enrolled in NYU um, MA PhD program since September 2020. Before that, I received my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Tongju University in China. During my PhD, I did three internships at NVIDIA Research and I published uh, nine first author papers in top venues like CDPR and RAL. I attended 12 lectures uh, from multiple departments at Tandon and Grant, including uh, Professor Giuseppe and Ludwig's uh, three, uh, three, three of their great courses. Yeah. And uh, here is the outline of this presentation. I will firstly talk about the background and overview and then present my PhD research from two perspectives collaborative perception and retrospective perception. And then I will conclude the talk with future works and technology tools. Yeah, nowadays autonomous vehicles can improve the productivity across various fields in humans' life, like self-driving cars, last mile delivery, construction and industrial automation, right? And perception aims to acquire, process, and interpret sensor data like uh, LiDAR point clouds or RGB cameras so that it can understand the surrounding dynamic environments. It's actually the eye of the autonomous vehicles. So it's a quite important module. Okay, sorry, can come out. Oh, existing solutions for perception systems is actually data-driven methods or machine learning methods. The typical process is that you first need to collect some data and then do some human annotations to try to get the desired format of the output. And then you train your model and deploy it in the real world. There are several key challenges in this, um, uh, in this process. The first one lies in the input. Because of the limited sensing capabilities of LiDAR or cameras, uh, you will get very sparse uh, measurements. And also due to the geometric relationships of the 3D objects, there will be frequent uh, occlusions. So you can see that here, they are, uh, here is a point cloud and here is the RGB image. There will be you know, very uh, sparse information on 2D or in 3D. Right? And the second challenge uh, lies in the human annotations because you want to get different formats of the output, right? So you need to you know, annotate the data first, like 3D bounding boxes, or 2D um, semantic labels or 3D occupancies. But these methods uh, require high cost and label intensive uh, human annota annotations, which is quite uh, inefficient and not scalable. And the third challenge lies in the sensor equipment. Although LiDAR can improve the geometry measurements, it's more expensive and less portable than cameras. So a quick summary of the key challenges the input is sparse and incomplete. The label is costly and LIDAR is, uh, is expensive. So this challenge actually motivates my PhD research. I aim to develop machine learning based algorithms and systems to address these three challenges so that autonomous vehicles can learn to you know, perceive the occluded and long range objects and perceive the scene without any human annotations. And finally, perceive the 3D world purely from 2D RGB images without requiring range sensors. And finally, these efforts can promote the robustness, efficiency, and scalability of the perception system. This sounds quite 
uh, this sounds quite uh, impossible, right? Because you want too many things. You want perceived occluded objects without the human annotations and with only RGB cameras. Uh, but to achieve the objective, we really try to, you know, exploit additional channels of information. And my strategy lies in two folds. The first one is um, actually multiple vehicles could, you know, encounter each other on the road, right? So they can actually share their information to each other to try to extend its field of view, right? That's actually called uh, multi-agent collaboration. And second strategy is that, uh, which is also quite uh, feasible and practical, you can imagine that uh, when you drive, you typically have a certain kind of spatial error, which you will, you will drive every day, right? For, such as from um, six, uh, six, six MTC from your home, and you will drive, drive uh, with a very regular route every day, every week, or every month, right? So this can accumulate a lot of uh, historical observations of the same spatial error. So we will actually want to try to exploit the past observations of the vehicle. That's called memory retrospection. So this kind of two uh, strategies actually corresponds to two dimensions. The first one is spatial dimension because the multi-agent collaboration actually tries to extend its uh, field of view against, you know, towards the th uh, 3D space, right? Another, uh, the other is uh, corresponds to, you know, a temporal dimension. You really try to, you know, exploit the past information. And during my PhD, I have developed novel collaborative and retrospective perception methods to address these three challenges. And I have published and submitted six papers, including one CVPR uh, highlight presentation and one uh, neuro spotlight presentations, uh, which are quite selective. And today I'm going to talk about my three recent works. Uh, one is about collaborative perception and the other two are about retrospective perception. Okay. Um, so the reason I select these three works is that uh, they are really the most uh, interesting works during my PhD. Uh, during my PhD, uh, we really try to you know think about how humans socialize with others and how humans perceive the three D using our using our own visual sensors, visual sensing, right? We try to draw some inspiration from the human intelligence, and I prepare these three cards to you know three uh th these three projects and to try to keep things a bit more interesting. And in the following, I will turn them over, uh, turn them over one by one, and I will try to firstly give you some sense of our insights inspired by human intelligence. And then I will talk about how we ground our insights uh, to real world problem solving. Now let's start it with the uh, first project. It's actually inspired by the social deduction uh, game. Before we start, I want to ask, uh, have you played uh, such kind of you know, social deduction game like Among Us or Evelyn? Uh, I assume, <laughs> I, uh, just, uh, just like you said, no, I assume, uh, <laughs> Some of you have played, uh, especially in our uh, in our lab. We have our lab mates uh, like play playing such kind of game, and uh, this uh, this inspired our uh, first project among us, adversely robust collaborative perception uh, by consensus, which we published in last year's ICCV. And uh, these social deduction games actually, uh, you know, they have some good players and bad players. And during game play, uh, players can observe, uh, can talk to each other and observe others' behaviors and try to deduce whether they are good or bad. And at the same time, the bad guys uh, try to pretend they are good guys. So this game actually involves both collaborative and adversarial relationships in multi-agent system. So this reminds me of the multi-agent perception where the vehicles you know, share a message to each other, just like humans talking to each other, right? And in, uh, in practice, there, are, there might be some bad guys, some malicious agents, they try to share some adversarial message, like, you know, here. Um, this is a prior work published in ICCV 2021. This red card denotes uh, the uh, the bad bad vehicle, the attacker. The attacker tried to, you know, share some harmful message to mislead the victim agent so that it will uh, generate some, you know, uh, very, uh, very, very, very bad uh, output in the perception space. And uh, to pretend it, it, it is a good guy, just like in a social deduction game, uh, this kind of malicious agents try to, you know, carefully optimize uh, a, a very indistinguishable noise during uh, using adversarial learning. Uh, such noise is just a very slight perturbation in the feature space. You can see that here, these two images actually shows the original message and the perturbated message. 
there is nearly no difference compared with uh, if you compare with these two uh, two messages, right? But in the output space, and here this is the BV uh, detection, you can see that there will be a lot of false positive denotes by the uh, blue bounding boxes. So the ego vehicle will mistakenly thought that there are obstacles in the free space. So it, this will uh, this will cause some you know some traffic jam. So uh, which is not what we want, right? Um, yeah. So to to solve this uh, challenge, previous methods uh, requires adversarial training, uh, which is quite intuitive. You just you know try to augment your training samples with some adversarial samples and try to you know improve the robustness uh, against these kinds of carefully optimized adversarial message. But you need to firstly know the attacker, what the algorithm the attacker is using, right? So this kind of method is uh, lack of generalizable capability. It cannot generalize to different attacking algorithms. And second, it needs uh, introduce, uh, it, uh, it can int introduce computational overhead during training. So this leads to our research question. Can we enable the ego vehicle to try to deduce the role of surrounding vehicles, just like uh, our humans? We can not, we, we, we do not just naively trust everyone, right? Especially if we uh, are playing a social deduction game. So uh, if, if, if the vehicle can also try to deduce the role of surrounding vehicles so that, so that it can try to, you know, just connect with the good guys while reject, uh, reject the attackers. That's our uh, research question. And so we try to um, propose our own solution using, you know, uh, consensus. So our solution is try to do role identification, which means that we want to identify whether this agent is a good guy or bad guy, rather than just naively trusting all teammates. And also because we are trying to, you know, verify the consensus in the output space. So we do not require the knowledge of the attacking algorithms. So our method can be generalizable to different threat models. And this is a problem setup. It's very simple. We assume there are a certain ratio of attackers, and then uh, the ego vehicle can identify what, whether there is an attacker among among the you know among teammates based on it, based on its output because we just show that uh, there will be a a, a very uh, notable difference in the output space. Right? There will be a lot of uh, false positive bounding boxes, and we have two setups: the static uh, static teams and dynamic teams, which means that the vehicle will talk to different guys. Um, and um, yeah, and this leads to our solution, which is uh, actually borrow some ideas from the random sampling consensus uh, in robust estim estimation. Our solution uh, is uh, RoboSec. And we also employ a similar hypothesized and verify workflow. And firstly, we will produce perception results using the individual observation, which means that uh, now uh, we, we want to guarantee that there is no uh, harmful message, right? Because we don't want to utilize any other's information. We want to utilize our own information, right? This can guarantee that uh, this output is actually safe, uh, although it's not that perfect. Um, and the second step is that, well, we, we, we try to utilize other's information that we will randomly select a certain number of teammates, like we, we want five teammates, and then we sample five teammates uh, from the surrounding vehicles to generate uh, the, other, uh, 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 the other set of output. And then we can verify the consensus between the two output. The first one is that we utilize our own individual observ uh, observation. And the second one is that we, we, we have utilized several others information. And then it's very similar to RANSAC. If it, it's success, the consensus verification is success, um, then they, that we will just output the collaborative perception results. If it's not success, then we'll continue to uh, sample until using up the budget. And our objective now, uh, let's skip this because it's very similar to RANSAC. We just try to maximize the probability of at least one successful sampling. But the interesting thing is that with this equation, we can actually uh, have a certain kind of, you know, um, mathematical equation to calculate two, two, uh, two, uh, two, two setups. Because now we have a computation performance trade-off. Um, because you can uh, imagine that if there are more teammates, in the sample subset, because um, yeah, you can sample any numbers, right? And there will be uh, more information you can try to exploit right? because you have more collaborators. So this will lead to better perception performance because you have more information. But at the same time, 
uh, this will increase the risks of being attacked because the attacker ratio is fixed. So you sample more, and then you will have higher probability of being uh, attacked, right? So this will need longer sampling time to reject potential attackers. And this leads to our uh, equation uh, one and two. And the first one is that we can try to prioritize the computation. We, we, we want to firstly set up the sampling budget n. For example, we want uh, we only want to sample three times, right? We only have such kind of you know uh, budget, and then we can calculate the maximum number of attacker frame collaborators that would be found, right? So that we can um, get a, a very good performance with a certain statistical guarantee. And the second uh, setup is that we can prioritize the uh, the, the performance. So uh, we we can try to firstly set up to specify the desired number of collaborators we want to have. For example, I only want five teammates, right? And then we can calculate the upper bound of a sampling budget, which uh, is calculated by this equation. So this means that our, uh, our, our consensus would be achieved before this number uh, at a certain you know, probability. Yeah, and we verify this framework uh, in a practical uh, task, collaborative 3D of that detection. And here is some basic setup, and now let's uh, look at the results. And firstly, we try to you know, validate our mathematical equation. And we find that uh, given a certain number of attacker ratio with the design number of collaborators, and then we can calculate the upper bound n right, using the uh, uh, aforementioned equation. And then we, we find the success rate is quite high, which means that the consensus can be mostly achieved within the theoretical upper bound. And uh, sorry, and uh, and the other thing is that we can actually verify, you know, the average sampling steps, the actual sampling steps. So which which shows that the average sampling steps taken for consensus is actually much less than the upper bound, which is uh, quite good, right? We do not really want to, you know, uh, sample to the upper bound each time. Right? And the second, uh, secondly, we verify the detection performance with different sampling budgets because we have different setups, right? We can also prioritize the computation. So we specify you know, the sampling budgets to different numbers. And here we show that if we have more budgets, then we can have a better performance. And another interesting thing is that only sampling once can achieve a remarkable improvement. And here, the lower bound denotes uh, the, you know, the individual uh, perception, which means that you do not utilize any other information. You just utilize your own message. Only uh, own information, own sensor, sensory information, right? You can see that only sampling one, uh, once uh, each time, you can have a, a much higher average precision in, in, in terms of 3D text. And also, we um, quantitatively uh, verify the performance and computation trade off. And here we show that the x axis is average sampling steps. It actually denotes you know, uh, the computation. And y axis actually denotes the uh, you know performance, and we show that the detection precision is higher with uh, with more teammates, but at the cost of more computation to try to reject the attackers. It's quite um, interesting. And uh, finally, we verify the you know generalizability of our method. Uh, we have mentioned that we do not rely on you know uh, the knowledge of the threat model, so that we, we want to show that our method can defend against different attackers. Right. So we show that. Um, with two different attackers, our average precision can be comparable, right? But compared to the baseline method at virtual training, you can see that um, the average precision could be significantly degraded to, you know, from 75 points to 43 points, right? So this is quite notable. Okay, that's, um, that's about the first project. And now let's, let, let me do a summary. The key takeaway is that uh, we, we propose attacker identification, um, which means that we want the robot to intelligently you know, deduce the role of the surrounding vehicles to try to collaborate with the good guys instead of you know, uh, the attackers. So this kind of method is more generalizable uh, to adversarial training, which just uh, naively trust all teammates. And the second key takeaway is that um, there is actually, actually a computational performance trade-off and we can actually try to use some basic probability uh, mathematics to try to statistic, uh, statistically guarantee the safe collaboration.
And the limitation is that we attack the uh, we, we assume the attacker ratio is fixed, uh, but it may may, may may be changed. And also we assume uh, the output if uh, the effect on the output space is very significant, which is quite common in uh, in the prior adversarial attack algorithms. Um, but future attackers may uh, create some very dangerous yet uh, very imperceptible perturbations in both input space and output space. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the uh, to the retrospective perception, is there any questions uh, from the audience uh, about the uh, yeah about the previous the first project? Okay. Um, okay. Maybe that, let's take the questions uh, at at the end. Uh, if not, let's move on to the second project, um, which is actually inspired by human memory mechanism. Um, before we start, um, please do me a favor. Uh, try to imagine that when you drive on the road, uh, for example, from Tandon to your home, and after you get him back home, do you remember how many people pass by you? And what do these people look like? And what color are, are their clothes? Um, do you remember those kinds of minor details? I believe you will not remember those kinds of, you know, very minor things. Um, however, you may remember that there are some buildings, there are some uh, notable landmarks, right? So after after that, you when you revisit the same place, you will quickly realize that okay, I have been here before, right? So this in actually inspired our second project. Um, uh, memorize what matters. Uh, emergency decomposition from multi traverse, uh, which is just accepted by. Uh, this year's New York as a spotlight presentation. And as I just mentioned, our high level intuition is that the human tends to remember those permanent things while ignoring those ephemeral things. And permanent things like buildings, roads, traffic signs will exist for a very long time so that it can easily make some impression, right? But those kinds of you know, ephemeral or transient objects, you know, like pedestrians or high speed vehicles, they only last for a very short time, right? So they will usually do not impress you. They will usually do not impress you. Yeah, and and then let, let's inspire our uh, project and, and we want to raise this research question. Can we design an autonomous system which can automatically remember or memorize the consistent 3D structures while ignoring all transient or ephemeral objects? Actually, this, this question is uh, quite relevant to autonomous mapping, which is a very classic uh, robotic mapping problem. The basic definition is we try to create a spatial representation of the 3D environment from raw sensor input like LiDAR point cloud or camera images or, or with both. And it, it has wide applications um, in localization, navigation, and others. And the challenges of you know, prior existing solution is that uh, these kinds of dynamic objects like vehicles, or pedestrians, um, they will destroy the multi-view consistency because uh, they will uh, appear at different 3D space, right, at different times. So this uh, this is very hard for you know uh, 3D reconstruction uh, from 2D images. And the private uh, previous solutions, the the solution is you know use supervised learning to try to firstly train a 2D segmentation model, and then they will mask out those kinds of things. Right, but it's uh it's it requires human annotations at the beginning. The second challenge is that um, RGB images are lack of depth information, so you usually require lidar sensors to get uh, to get some you know very good geometry. So uh, different from prior the prior works are uh, inspired by you know humans memory mechanism. We propose our solution, uh, which is actually a multi session or multi traversal autonomous mapping framework which is purely self-supervised without requiring human annotations and which is camera-only method without requiring range sensors. And our solution is that given a robot, we have a certain route, just like uh, with humans, we have a regular you know, uh, navigation routes, right? And we, we will navigate in these routes day by day, right? And then we have multiple traversal um, data, right? For each traversal, for example, we only have a RGB camera, so that it actually denotes, uh, you know, um, uh, image collections or RGB video. And then we collect these kinds of, you know, multiple image sets, and then we input our model, which is uh, named 3DGM. And now it's our key um, 
key innovation. So we, what we can achieve is that we can actually decompose these multiple image sets to two parts. And our intuition is that those kinds of you know, environment pixels, they are observed again and again across different traversals, right? The buildings are always there, no matter um, when you come to this location, right? So they actually, these 2D pixels are consistent across traversals. So I call them consensus in 2D. And this 2D actually indicate that these 2D pixels actually belongs to you know, permanent, some permanent 3D objects. And the other, um, the other branch is that those kinds of you know, transient object pixels, like you know, dynamic uh, vehicles or parked vehicles, but, uh, but you know, for example, they only appear in a single traversal, the, like parked vehicle, right? And after several uh, hours or several days ago, they may disappear, right? Those kinds of you know, dynamic objects or transient but static objects, they actually uh, desensus, right? Desensus pixels, and they actually denote the transient objects, uh, ephemeral objects in 3D. So we, we really uh, leverage these kinds of you know, self-division to try to decompose these 2D, uh, decompose these image sets to two parts so that we can, um, simultaneously do 3D environment mapping and 2D ephemeral object segmentation. Yeah, before we move to the details, let's, uh, let me give you some pre preliminary background uh, if, you, if you are not familiar with the 3D Gaussian spread. Actually, 3DGS is a very uh, great paper in computer graphics communities, and it is actually the best paper uh, in last year's C-graph. Um, and the basic idea is that uh, it represents the same using a group of 3D Gaussians and this 3D Gaussians has, uh, you know, each Gaussian has a group of learnable attributes, including its 3D position, its orientation and scale to fit the geometry and the opacity and the colors. And then it has, uh, uh, has an initialization stage, you know, they try to leverage the uh, traditional, um, traditional structure from motion pipeline, like, like a core map to initialize, initialize the Gaussians with, you know, the sparse 3D reconstruction points. And then it, uh, it has a splatting based rasterization method, uh, which is purely differentiable. So it can try to optimize those kinds of attributes, including the position orientation, those kinds of things of these Gaussians by minimizing the rendering loss. But here is the equation. You can see that here, uh, this IT denotes the real image, the image you, uh, you have collected. And here, this equation denotes that it can actually render a generated image using the Gaussians with, at a certain kind of camera pose. And then they will uh, compare the difference between these two images and then back, back propagate the, uh, this loss to the Gaussian's attributes to try to optimize those Gaussians to try to let them fit the 3D scene geometry and the photometry. And, and 3D Gaussian's has a very good property because it, it can integrate both uh, geometric and photometric information. So it, has, uh, it can enable a wide um, range of applications like uh, Neural rendering and 3D reconstruction, adapt estimation, a lot of a lot of tasks. Um, yeah, the other uh, pre second preliminary knowledge is a variant foundation model, and here we utilize Dino V2, which is uh, released by uh, Meta. It's actually pre-trained on a very large scale data data sets composed of you know 100 million images to try to learn some robust visual representations. And the reason why why we use Dino V2 feature is that because um, these kinds of you know multiple traversals, they will have certain you know um, discrepancy across uh, uh, traversals in in terms of the visual appearance because there will be some lighting change or some even some weather change, right? So we really want to increase our robustness against these uh, changes. So why, that's why we distill uh, we add a uh, Dino V two feature vectors, which is a high dimensional features. Uh, to the group of Gaussian attributes right here, in, in addition to the you know position, um, orientation, skill, opacity, colors, and we add a uh, high dimensional semantic features. And now it's our uh, mathematical formulation, and this is a very high level, but I think um, it's very uh, very use very useful and can really solve the problem. And what we formulate this problem is that we try to formulate these multiple session, multiple traversal autonomous mapping problem as a certain kind of you know, robust representation learning free, uh, framework. And our objective is that we try to optimize a certain kind of 3D representation of the static environment. And we want to uh, use, leverage the differentiable rendering pipeline to try to 
minimizing the algorithmic rendering loss to you know learn, learn, learn this representation. And our input is actually these images, and our output is the 3D Gaussians, right? And our framework is that um, we have certain in layers, just you know, robust estimation problem because these environment pixels uh, they appear again and again and again, right? Across traversal, so they occupy a high proportion. Uh, of, from the old data samples. And those kinds of object pixels, they actually only uh, only appear for a very short uh, duration, right? Just appear uh, in a few images. So they occupy a very low ratio. So that's why we can you know, model the objects as, uh, as outlier and model environment as in layers. And then we can just you know, try to kick off those kinds of outlier pixels. We'll only learn the representations from the inline pixels. And during optimization, we, we find very interesting scenario is that those kinds of transient pixels, actually transient objects, they actually emerge um, in the rendering loss map. And here, let me show you uh, a visual example. This first column is actually two RGB images. And the second column is actually the normalized uh, feature rendering loss, uh, loss map. And you can see that the more red, uh, the value is higher. And you can see that these kinds of you know uh, uh, red areas actually denote you know uh, the the vehicles right in, on the road right. So then we we just apply some very basic uh, control detection mechanism to try to exploit the gradient information in this two D image and extract some convex holes, and so that we can get the third column right here. We can actually get you know object segmentation two D object segmentation from the spatial rendering loss map. And you can, when you look back to the first uh, column, actually, these marks uh, can uh, accurately segment these buses, vehicles, right? And even some pedestrians. Uh, th this example does not include pedestrians, but we can actually segment both uh, pedestrians and vehicles. And okay, let's give this it just, um, this it means that we, after we get masks, we will just apply the mask to try to, you know, remove those outliers and le only, uh, only learn, you know, 3D environment map representation. Okay, now it's the evaluation. Um, we construct a data set, you know, with, with the you know public data sets, Ethica 365, which is uh, released by um, Cornell University, and uh, new plan data set, which uh, is uh, released by Motional. And we, we have collected 40 locations. Um, each location, there are more than 10 traversals, and in total, we have over 30,000 images. And um, and let's see the quantitative segmentation results because we really want to just, just not visually evaluate you know, those kinds of segmentation masks. We also want to quantitatively evaluate this segmentation accuracies. And how we achieve this is that we utilize some, because we don't have ground truth masks, we just utilize some supervised trained masks to provide some, you know, supervised trained model to provide some you know, pseudo ground truth. And then we can compare with certain kinds of unsupervised segmentation methods. And you can see that Compared to the um, baseline method, which just achieve you know an intersection of union around you know 20 20 20 percent, we can actually achieve over 40 percent, which is a very notable improvement. And here is a, a visualization of this 2D mask, and let me show you one videos to illustrate the segmentation results. These are actually nine videos, nine traversals at the same location, right? You can see that. Uh, the, the left figure is uh, RGB image and the right figure is a, a corresponding segmentation mask. And in most, in most cases, the mask can accurately reflect the object boundaries. Okay, now uh, it's a very interesting ablation study and we try to you know, re really want to know what matters in our system, right? And, um, and let me show you one interesting ablation study. And we ablation the number of traversals because you know we ha we have a multi traversal setup, multi session setup. We really want to you know uh, set up different numbers of traversal to see whether this can influence your segmentation performance, right? And you can see that here we, with only one traversal, the IOU is very low, right? Just around 15 percent. And when we raise the numbers of traversals to ten, it will gradually increase the uh, IOU scores to over 50%. And here is uh, another qualitative results. And you can take a look at the first row. And the first row is that uh, we have a, you know, a RGB image in the first column. And there are you know, actually three parked buses, right? 
And if we only use one traversal, we cannot actually se uh, segment those kinds of you know static park vehicles because in this traversal, all images uh, capture these kinds of you know uh, static objects. They actually uh, keep uh, keep static across the across the whole traversal. But uh, there is lack of you know reference to help you find the distances, right? Actually, in this single traversal scenario, these kinds of uh, product vehicles belongs to the environment, right? Because it doesn't have any motion. So when we increase the number of traversals, you can see that after uh, only after uh, only with one additional traversal, we can actually segment out those kinds of static buses. Okay. Uh, here we can also try to extract you know the 3D geometry from the Gaussians, and here we show some depth uh, depth map of the uh, of the method, and this is a a video on new plan data set. And the depth map uh, looks good overall, um, uh, but it it has certain kind of limitations on the road because there is really a lack a lack of texture on the road, so it's quite hard to um, you know. Learn the you know learn the uh, geometry in these text textureless areas, but for those kind of buildings or trees or um, or traffic size, the depth uh, information is uh, is kind of you know satisfactory. And lastly, we verify the rendering results of our method. You can see that compared with the original three D Gaussian splatting method, um, our method has a more clean environment map because you know. Um, in the 3D, uh, in the original 3D GIS implementation, it's not handle those kinds of dynamic things. So it will cause some artifacts due to the multi-view inconsistency, right? Because, uh, uh, and, and in our method, we can try to segment those kinds of transient things. So we can um, we can reduce the influence of those transient things in our environment representation. And here uh, is a very, uh, very, very interesting Demo and I show you six videos, six novel view synthetic videos in these six locations, and we can actually control the camera pose uh, in this Gaussian splatting and try to render the uh, novel views, which are actually not present in the training camera trajectories. Okay, so these kinds of capabilities capabilities would help us to you know build some photorealistic uh, simulation um, toolkit, right? And in our representation, the good thing is that we can actually have such kind of empty streets, right? Empty uh, environment representation without any uh, dynamical transient objects. Um, yeah. Okay, that's um, basically about the second project. And the key takeaway is that the multi-traversal consensus and defenses could be utilized as a self sufficient signal to decompose the environment abstracts. And this is quite, you know, uh, quite interesting. And we formulate the problem as a uh, robust estimation problem. And repeated traversals of the same location and could, pro uh, could provide more camera observations because now you have uh, more, uh, more 2D observations, right? Actually, this can help you uh, reconstruct the 3D uh, in, uh, with higher accuracy, even without LIDAR. We have actually empirically found that if we only have one or two traversals, uh, even the initialization of the 3D Gaussian will, will fail. And the third thing is that those kinds of robust variant foundation models like Dino V2, they can provide certain uh, a certain kind of you know robust feature representations, and this can these features can you know help help you identify the consensus across traversals because you can really have certain kind of robustness against lighting change, and also you have certain kind of you know semantic meaningfully uh, semantic features right to represent the three D environment, which is much more robust than the sensitive RGB space. And the limitations uh, is that uh, we cannot st we still cannot model very uh, long term seasonal change like you know uh, win uh, spring to winter or spring to fall because uh, there will be some uh, seasonal environment change like you know leaves may may disappear right so this kind of change cannot be uh, handled so um, and also there are uh, still some noise in our segmentation results and the future works including you know maybe uh, design more uh, robust methods and use more uh, design more robust foundation model to, uh, in, in, to, to, to to have better feature representation in both 2D and 3D. Okay, uh, that's about the second project. And um, uh, now let's, uh, let's look at, you know, the last one. And this one is not shown in the dissertation proposal. And so I hope you can enjoy the last, last work. 
And uh, yeah, third one is also relative to human memory mechanism. And uh, our basic intuition is that we humans are living in a changing environment, right? Um, this, uh, the, the time, time, time flies, right? The things change quickly, right? So, but we can adaptively uh, refresh our memory and notice the change in the 3D space, right? This actually motivates, uh, inspire our third project, the Memo Gaussian, 4D Gaussian splitting with spatial memory. And here is actually uh, an example. I, uh, I show you two images um, at the same location, right? When you revisit the same place, you can easily detect the change in, uh, in, in this parking slot, right? Maybe somewhere else par parked on your uh, slot, right? And um, so this, uh, uh, so based on this observation, this memory uh, update, memory refresh, we want to raise the following question. Uh, can we design a left flow mapping system which can automatically refresh your memory, refresh the robot's memory and localize, you know, the novel uh, emerging objects which are not, um, which are not existing in the in the past, and this uh, here is a quick recap of the three D Gaussian splitting because we build uh, still build our method on the Gaussian splitting framework, and I want to I just want to highlight one thing because I have briefly uh, introduced the whole pipeline in the in the second project, and and here uh, you, 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 here I want to highlight that the initialization of these Gaussians is actually uh, they use some classic structure from motion. To have some structure, uh, have some have some sparse 3D, 3D reconstruction to try to utilize, to try to initialize the Gaussians, right? It doesn't use, utilize the memory information, the temporal information. But in our method, uh, in our solution, we really try to utilize a certain kind of spatial memory built in the past to initialize the current um, feature, uh, to initialize the current uh, Gaussian representation. And the second thing is that uh, instead of the 3D things we actually try to incorporate a temporal dimension to the Gaussians. We have these 4D Gaussians because now we want to model those kinds of emerging objects, right? Those kinds of emerging objects are totally removed uh, in the previous project, but now we want, to uh, we want to model them in space and time domains, right? So that's why we add a temporal dimension because these kinds of objects uh, could, could be movable, right? And then uh, our initialization is that we firstly leverage the spatial memory, which is actually an environment representation like buildings and roads and traffic signs. We utilize them to initialize our current 3D Gaussians, environment 3D Gaussians. And then we have some depth estimation of the current images and we calculate the difference of those uh, depth map. And then we use, utilize this depth difference to initialize object Gaussians, which are 4D Gaussians. And then we have a certain kind of, you know, end-to-end uh, -end, uh, differentiable pipeline to try to optimize these kinds of compositional Gaussians, which uh, include both 3D Gaussians and 4D Gaussians. Let me introduce a more detail. Again, this whole pipeline is self-supervised without any human notations and is camera only without requiring range sensors. And the workflow is that uh, we still have an agent, right? This autonomous agent can still repeatedly uh, navigate along this route at different times, right? And then we can leverage uh, our second project to try to build a certain kind of spatial memory, right? Because you remember, you remember that we have multiple traversal data, and now we can try to build us an empty, uh, empty street, right? Uh, a purely environment representation. And after we receive the most recent uh, traversal images, traversal data, we can do some depth estimation to calculate the depth map of the current images, right? And then we have these kinds of spatial memory, which are also uh, represent, represented by Gaussian splitting to render some environment depths, right? And then we can calculate the difference in the depths uh, depth images because we really want to try to firstly identify some, to provide some, you know, pr provide some information. Uh, where, where has, uh, which errors in the 2D images have been changed, right? And then we unproject those 2D pixels based on depth value to 3D to initialize object field. And environment field is again, is initialized by the Gaussian memory right here. And um, now it's a good thing that we have these two compositional um, representation, right? We can actually uh, respectively, individually uh, render, render in 3D, right? We can just rasterize the object field onto 2D images to get the object rendering. We can also just try to, you know, uh, render the environment, right? Which, uh, which includes include, include just buildings, uh, roads, trays, those kinds of environment elements. And we can also compo uh, compose this 
can combine these two representations to get the you know full image rendering, right? And this is a uh, again this is a, a you know uh, the 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 inference pipeline. But how to optimize? How to learn such kind of very powerful, very uh, very interesting compositional thing representation? We utilize uh, we just utilize the rendering loss. We still utilize uh, the self surveillance right? The rendering loss is that uh, we have a, the current traversals RGB images, and then we back propagate the rendering uh, rendering image rendered image and our ground truth uh, collected image, right? And we back propagate the loss functions, the loss values, you know, to the uh, two representation object fields and environment fields. Okay, now it's the most important uh, techniques to try to learn such kinds of a uh, very clear decomposition of these two fields. We actually have a certain kind of regularization. This regularization is that we try to, you know, control these two components to not try to confuse each other because if you do not have such kind of regularizations, uh, then these two fields may easily, you know, uh, integrate to each other, right? So this regression is also a, a simple self-supervised loss function. The basic idea is that we already have a strong, uh, strong uh, prior knowledge, right? We, ha we have a certain kind of memory, right? We only want the object field give some output if there is uh, when, the, when there is there is a need, right? Because when you, sometimes the environment field can already have a very good rendering performance, but uh, for those kind of emerging objects, uh, uh, this this environment field cannot fit the uh, fit the rendering, uh, right? So we utilize this kind of regularization to try to avoid the confusion. And finally, uh, uh, and now let's see the results. And here is some um, rendering results. And you can see that the last column, the first col column is actually the object rendering, right? We can, um, let's play it again. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, here, uh, you can see that we can uh, easily just uh, render the, the dynamic objects or parked vehicles on the road, right? And interesting thing is that you can see that our spatial memory could be in a sunny day, but our current observation the observation could be in a rainy day, right? But we can still, you know, um, decompose those emerging objects at different weathers. And also we have a, 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 another example on the highway, and we can uh, decompose this uh, bus on parked vehicles in 3D and then render them uh, individually, right? And uh, yeah, and the cool thing is that now we actually have a certain kind of, you know, 4D representation. So this can enable us not only just compositional rendering, but also we can do some simple post-processing. We can just try to cluster in 3D and try to find, you know, those kinds of instance, right? So this can help us to do some scene simulation like object removal. And here I show you, uh, for example, the first column is actually the um, original image and we can actually remove those kinds of instance in the 3D scene. And then these four vehicles uh, will all disappear. And uh, the other thing is that we can actually uh, do some object insertion. We can uh, we can localize some objects in uh, from a different day and to insert them to a, uh, to, a to 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 another day, right? So this results in the, this uh, um, these images. And this really in, uh, in enable us to do some thing editing, thing simulation uh, without any human supervision, without any human annotations. So it's quite useful. And we also uh, you know verify the quantitative results in segmentation or segmentation results is much better than a second project. We can even achieve, uh, you know, uh, uh, over uh, nearly 70% uh, segmentation intersection of union in 2D. And we also have much better rendering scores. Uh, let's skip this. Okay, so it's enabled a lot, a lot of applications like auto labeling, we can extract the 3D representation and also in, in, we can do simulation mapping and provide certain pseudo ground truths. Okay, quick summary of the third project. The key takeaway is that the, the spatial memory can be leveraged as a strong reference to you know, track the change in the space-time space, uh, space -time domains. And these repeated traversals can enable self-supervised uh, 4D representation learning. And this kind of uh, coin-based, Gaussian-based representation is very flexible uh, to model the thing at instance level. Right? And for the limitation, we still focus on short video clip. And in the future, we try to you know, extend the Gaussian representation uh, along a very long video sequence, like, you know, uh, over 10 kilometers. And now we only use a monocular camera and we, we will try more camera input in the future. 
Okay. Uh, now let's conclude the presentation. And today, I basically, I talked about three works about collaborative perception. The first one is collaborative perception, and the other one, the other two is uh, about you know retrospective perception. And I really try to you know firstly give you some sense of why why we try to you know propose this kind kind of solutions to to solve the problems. And um, uh, the first one is that we in, we inspired by you know Stillman's sort of deduction game to try to let the robot to intelligently select good guys to collaborate, which can improve the adversarial robustness with a certain statistical guarantee. And the second project is that we try to utilize the um, the memory uh, the, the 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 memory of the robot to try to utilize the self surveillance across multiple traversals to decompose the scenes to 3D environment and 2D segmentation. And finally, uh, the third project is that we leverage those kinds of uh, mem uh, spatial memory, and then we can we can also utilize it to you know localize the emerging objects, novel objects in a new traversal, right? So that we can enable the self-supervised uh, 4D scene representation learning, which can uh, help us to do scene simulation. And um, I also have some other works which are not introduced uh, in this talk, um, but they are still uh, closely relevant to you know uh, collaborative and retrospective perception. And also um, commit to you know build data sets and benchmarks. I utilize uh, color simulation technology to build a, a simulation multi vehicle data set, and also collaborate with the Great May Mobility uh, to propose you know a real world you know um, multi agent multi traversal software and data set to 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 uh, for the community right, and and I hope that uh, with these two strategies, the spatial temporal. The multi collaboration and you know memory retrospection, uh, we can uh, advance the robustness, efficiency, and scalability of not only just autonomous vehicle but also the autonomous robot perception. And I really hope to deploy, uh, uh, you know, in the future we can deploy the autonomous vehicles at scale to address you know society society challenges. And uh, during my PhD, I let me quickly do a quick some summary uh, of my uh, academic uh, academic achievements. I published. Over 20 papers with uh, Naya as the first author, and I published in top venues, including both uh, computer vision venues, uh, machine learning venues, as also robotics venues. And I uh, received over 2,000 citations, and I have two US patents uh, together with NVIDIA. And three of my first author papers are selected as uh, oral highlight spotlight presentation, which are highly selective in AI and vision communities. And I open source a code um, for the community and my a representative work of uh, VoxFormer, which is not including this pre presentation, but it received um, it is widely received in the community, which has received over 1,000 stars uh, in its GitHub repository. And I'm awarded a media graduate fellowship uh, in 2024. Um, and I really uh, thank, thanks uh, media for this uh, great honor. And for the outlook in the future, uh, because nowadays the large uh, large language model and or large Multi-model model can demonstrate very strong generalized, uh, generalization capabilities, and I, in the future, I hope to keep on to working on the you know uh, 3D those, those 3D things, 3D perception. But I really want to design some generalist uh, agent, not only just uh, autonomous vehicles on the road, right? But it can do anything like navigation, communication, manipulation, and with anybody, just just uh, not just using the self-driving car. And anywhere, like indoor, outdoor, or indoor to outdoor, outdoor to indoors, and anytime, you know, in different weather, different uh, conditions. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge my uh, advisors, Professor Chen, uh, Chen Fen, and Professor David, Professor Giuseppe, and Professor Ludwig for um, being my committee members. And also, I want to uh, thank Professor Zhao Han and Professor Chen Sihen in Tsinghua and Zhanghai Dongwu University. Thanks, uh, thanks for the, their host. Um, during the pandemic. I also want to uh, thank my managers and advisors at NVIDIA, including Marco, Jose, Sanya, Anima, Zhilin, and uh, Yue. And uh, I want to thank, uh, thank my collaborators uh, at NVIDIA and uh, other institutions. And I want to thank my lab mates at NYU, including my friends and my mentees. And I really appreciate your kindness and, uh, and insightful discussions. Uh, yeah, and finally, I would like to Thank my family for their love and thank everyone in this wonderful journey. I really enjoyed these four years 